Today we're talking week seven. All that and next on Armchair Sports Talk Football. All right, welcome back. My name is Sean Hicks, so let's just jump right into week seven. So we're in week seven. This is the meat, the heart of college football season. There's going to be marquee games on each major time block. There's going to be a lot of really fascinated second, third tier games. Hipster college football is all about this week. This is just, this is the best time, right? For the next four or five, pretty much now until SOCOM, SEC SOCOM Saturday, we're just going to get great weeks with great football. And it's, it's, it's the best time you can possibly be able to get. Um, a couple of reminders as we get into this. Week 7, SP Plus is almost completely eliminated, preseason projections at this point. What does that mean? That means teams are kind of who they are at this point. Obviously, they can still get better, but you have a pretty good idea of who you are. The SP Plus has been very accurate so far this year. It's going to continue being our main statistical analysis as we go forward. Um, another huge thing to remind her, winning on the road is really, really hard. If you're facing essentially a top 50 team on the road, that's a good win almost regardless of their qual- all the quality of what you feel the opponent is based off record. Um, that's going to be a solid win for anybody. Don't take any close games on the road um, for – Really, don't take them for granted because it's can, it's challenging to be able to do. Take a look at Georgia last week in a dogfight for Tennessee for the first half. Don't overreact to those. Once again, roads mean a huge deal, especially when you have really good home crowds in front of you. So just remind that if you're doing this. Um, some interesting games we're going to talk about this week. Iowa, Texas A&M are going to see how real any of these teams are or see if Texas A&M is going to be up there with Michigan as one of the most disappointing teams up there um one last thing is now we're in october or in mid-october damn near now is that rain and wind watch that and don't overreact to close games with rain and wind they are the ultimate equalizer when you really end up talking about um sloppy games and upsets always take a look at those because they just mess with everything and throw it a blender, especially if you're talking about teams that tend to be a little bit more pass heavy, a little bit more spread. While it's cliche, and you know I freaking hate cliches, it is pretty accurate, unless you're, say, um, Deshaun Kaiser in a hurricane against NC State, which is the funniest goddamn thing I've ever seen. But moving on, we're going to spend a majority of our time talking about the games this week, specifically OU Texas, um, because obviously Red River Shootout, Game Day. Um, you know, two of the highest ranked teams. Of course, you got Florida LSU. Um, but I really think this is probably, I mean, this and Florida LSU are the two most interesting games. But in a lot of ways, this is Oklahoma's first real team with a pulse they've paid. I mean, if you took the SP Plus rankings, whatever they've played so far, it's pretty atrocious. Now, that said, let's not underestimate what Jalen Hurts has been able to do as a quarterback of Oklahoma. Here's an interesting stat for you. Jalen Hurts QBR, which top QBR rating is 100, is 99 or better in every single major window. Of course, windows are 20 yards, above 20, between 20, um, between, um, sorry, above 15, between 15 and, and zero, and below the line of scrimmage. What does that mean? So when I talk about the stats, keep that in mind. Above 20, he is... A, he has a weakness on the right side. He's got a 9.8 QBR. He's got a 78, which is pretty darn good, for especially deep. 78 is like unheard of almost, deep left. He's got a 70 on the left. He's got a 70 on short left. And then he's got like some 48s on, on early screen passes that he has struggled. Very statistical, weird anomalies. Every other area of the field, um, 99 or better. That's unreal. That's ridiculous. And that's better than, oh, just throw out a few names I can't think of. You may have heard of them, say, Baker Mayfield. Um, who, who? Oh, yeah, Kyler Murray. Yeah, it's better than Kyler Murray. Now, listen, right, again, bad defenses through the entire time here. Um, and here's the thing, though. See, the, Texas is not a very good defense. And by not a very good defense, I mean they're actively bad. They're about 66. That's terrible for a Division One team. That That's – bottom of the barrel bad for any major division one team it's it, it's it bad and sure they played lsu you know that had a part of it lsu is also the number four ranked team in sp plus 
which means that because it's opponent adjusted, it's not having a giant effect. It means a lot of their other games, they've also been really disappointing on the defense side of ball. But really, I mean, are they? This is what they were last year, too. And of course, against West Virginia last year is your first they, last week. Yeah, they won by 11 points, and they're really up 18. But if you take a look at that profile of the game, that's a dead even game. A couple um, long interceptions and um, defensive touchdowns really swung that in Texas's favor. Again, Texas has been my most overrated team in the nation. Uh, they'll continue to be my most overrated team in the nation. Nothing against you as a program. There's nothing against uh, um, Tom Herman. It's 100% the way to do. They won a lot of close games last year, and AP Poll hasn't caught up with it. They're like 23rd in SP+, which I feel is a pretty good ranking for them. So Oklahoma's three. So obviously think we think Oklahoma is going to win this game on a neutral field. But uh, just some things I want to – if you haven't watched Oklahoma play or take a look at their profile, while they're still, you know, all this points, you know, you, but you think of the air raid as the way they're just blowing people up, and they are, but it's the fact that they are probably the best running team in the nation and the most efficient running team in the nation. That's really different about this group. Obviously, Jalen Hurts is a big part of this. He's averaging like 8.2 yards per carry, and obviously sacks account as against rushing against quarterbacks. Um, they uh, Their two other running backs are also doing very, very well, um, averaging over six yards per carry. It, this is a running team. And one that's really, really good. Um, uh, Rah- I'm going to mispronounce this name. Rahman Stevenson and Trey Sermon really know how to do it. Stevenson is just a ball of energy. The dude's averaging 11 yards per carry on over 100 carries, which is or not over 100 carries, um, but on a, a decent statistical sample size, that's pretty damn good. Like, kind of ridiculous on it. Um, that's, that's, I think, when I take a look at Texas, who's lost – all of these pieces up front still. And yes, they got shredded through the air by Joe Burrows and LSU. But I think the biggest problem for Texas is this, is they need to be able to bleed Oklahoma. They need to be able to win this game via turnovers, through penalties, through inefficiencies. Let the fact Oklahoma run a bunch of yards but not score points. The fact that Oklahoma can run the ball so damn well Hertz is very good um, using his legs and is a little bigger than, say, Kyler was, that it's it's hard to imagine that they're going to be able to be inefficient at any point that's going to present it. Unless they get a huge amount of fumble luck, I think they're going to convert consistently in the red zone, which is really what Texas needs to be able to do to slow down this offense because they're not going to be able to do it for yardage output. It's just not – realistic to be able to understand and then of course you got uh, lamb who's just tearing things up constantly from their receiving core and if, if you take a look at texas's statistical profile especially from just overall tackles i think four out of their five leading tackles are defensive backs what that tells you is this is that tells you they are not able to stop the running game consistently and that tells you they're completing a high percentage of passes what you really want is your linebackers to be the key cogs of tackles that tells you a lot of how the getting to because of that um the safeties and the cornerbacks being so high lots of passes incompleted tough to get people tough to get um, teams off the field from that and because they're getting a lot of tackles and run support as well that means they're getting to the third level first especially against Oklahoma that's going to be a really really bad sign since Lincoln Riley's so good if you're going to be out of position at all you're going to be doing a giant touchdown Um, it's just, it's really hard for me to imagine them not scoring points. Now on Texas side, to be fair, I want to talk about Sam Ellinger a little bit because the dude is really taking a step forward and that shouldn't be surprising, right? As someone who started a lot of times, you know, has, um, is now experienced as a junior started as a freshman, but I think it's sometimes like, Important to remind that it's really impressive to see a coaching staff get guys to go better. There's so many times looking at you, Felipe Franks, that you see uh, look really promising freshmen just kind of stagnate. That's not the case here. I think Ellinger is a real deal. I think he's really bailed Texas out, and his number should be a lot better. Texas has dropped a lot of freaking passes over the, um, so far. And yes, Duvernay had a great game against LSU, but like let's be real it it could it could be worse it it does help that I think that Texas is going to be efficient moving the ball on offense I think Ellinger is really good my problem is they can't really run at the rate they need to do I think to be able to really wear down the clock and hold it they can run a bunch of screens um, save the line of scrimmage but Oklahoma's defense is looking a lot better this year they're 38 in S&P plus and again, yes, quality competition. I do expect them to torch a little bit. But they actually got a lot better last year once you remove the stoops factor. 
And boy, let's be honest, the Stoops is a, was a factor of last year's team. They fired him. They got better the second half of the year. Sure, they got burned by um, Alabama. Let's not let that stick in your head. It's tough to replace a coordinator midseason and expect any two massive court um, turnaround. I think they look better, Coach, just on the eye test. They don't look like they're just idiotically just um, – can I just say this? Stoops is the – most ridiculous long tendered coach that somehow matched. Uh, if you have not seen the Baylor OU game from the Robert Griffin era, when they just ran freaking curl routes for 11 plays for a goddamn touchdown, seriously, go look at it. It's on SB nation. It's insane. Sidebar gone. Um, because they're better coach. I, it's an, it's hard to imagine Texas being able to keep up. I think Elliger is going to do a damn fine job of putting up points. I think he's going to look good in this game. I think this is going to be a shootout. The problem at the end of the day is from a defensive perspective, OU is so much better than Texas. And I know that sounds weird as hell to say, but it's true. And the fact that they can run the ball consistently is just going to keep this out of their hands. For Texas to win the game, here's your guy, Brennan Eagle. Brennan Eagle is averaging 25 yards per catch. Yeah, it's only at 11 catches, sure, but that's an insane freaking number, and he has to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, we all know Duvernay is great, and he is awesome and sounds like he should really be on LSU, if we're being honest. Um, but it's, Eagle needs to be your guy. He's got to get two deep balls to be able to win this game, and you have to put Oklahoma on the wind. If you get behind, this, you will die in this game. Um, you know, I think I think Texas kind of will keep it close for a half to three quarters, and OU really explodes out of the gates and run it, and expect Jalen Hurts to put up stupid video game like numbers again. I wouldn't be surprised if you see something along the lines of 500 yards of total offense. Seems relatively reasonable, unless they just end up getting a lot more support from their running back. Uh, but yeah, take give me Oklahoma um, to cover the spread in this game, which is about 11. Um, so Alabama, Texas A&M, I don't really want to talk about this game a whole lot. Uh, what I want to say is, besides probably Michigan, Texas A&M has been probably the most, most disappointing team. If you look at this, okay, a loss at home to Auburn is nothing to be too terrible about. You know, loss to Clemson on the road, right? But it's the way these losses happen. That Clemson game was basically out of hand, and they just kind of sat on them. I mean, the same as the Auburn game. That game was basically out of hand real early, and they just kind of sat on them. For the rest, it was never enough to be at an SNP pluses um, blowout metric where they stopped keeping the score of it. So they are, you know, like 19th in SNP, which is is a solid team, but I think that's a lie mostly. I think the way they decided to play, they being Clemson and Auburn, um, is overshooting the fact of the fact they got crushed by these two teams. Good teams, but then you take a look at the Arkansas game, which was really close. At, Probably should have won by a little bit more, but they definitely could have lost in it. This doesn't look like a top-tier team to me. This doesn't look like a team that has a chance to stop Alabama. I think you can score on Alabama with all the injuries that you have. I think Mon's the type of quarterback to do it. But for whatever reason, it's just not clicking. The offense is like in 40th, which is not good. It's pretty bad. And well, I'm going to say it's bad. It's mediocre as hell is what it is in SP+. Plus. And – you can't be mediocre. You got to be good because he, while your defense is pretty good, it, I, it's hard to imagine you stopping two on that offense from putting up a good amount of points. I mean, you have to score two. Um, they also, they don't get after the quarterback a whole lot. Um, Texas A&M does. They've been more bendy, don't breaky, I guess, has been a better way to put it. I don't want to go too far, but that's, that's kind of been how it, they've played so far. And I just don't think that's going to fly very much on Tua unless you're basically Georgia since it's the only team that successfully have done it. Um, I, I think despite being at Texas a and I, I kind of think Alabama runs away with this. It, they might cover its 17 spread. I, you know, I, I could see Texas A&M covering this, but it's going to be right around that. I don't feel like Alabama's ever going to feel like they're in trouble, to be honest. Um, so Iowa, Penn State. I, I was trying to decide whether I should go in detail on Iowa, Penn State, or Notre Dame, uh, USC. Maybe if USC wasn't starting their Pokemon at quarterback and they will had less injuries, I, you know, I'd feel better about it and maybe go more in detail. But, but I think Iowa and Penn State is actually the more interesting game. Now, when I say interesting I mean from like a football perspective of what it means in the races I don't necessarily mean from like a watching and entertainment factor because let's be honest Notre Dame USC is probably more entertaining 
with higher quality athletes on both sides compared to just one side. So here's why. You're playing Iowa at Kinnick Stadium at night. That's a goddamn hellmouth is what that is. You do not go to Kinnick Stadium at night. Recent ease of Kinnick Stadium at night experience are, oh, the Ohio State 55-20 game. The Michigan 2016 under Harbaugh's best year when we were just rolling through everybody like they were barely there. Yep, lost a stupid game in Kinnick. Um, They almost did it to Penn State, Barkley, two years ago, right, when Penn State was definitely a great team. So, yeah, don't go play Iowa at Kinnick, especially at night. It's going to be a miserable time. It's especially going to be a miserable time because the way Iowa plays defense is the type of team that Penn State has really struggled with in the past and I think is going to get them again here. So Penn State's an interesting factor. If you take a look at um, the delta yards per play, so basically take a look at what you're getting on your offense, what you're getting on defense, right, subtract that difference between the teams. Um, they're tied with Ohio State for number three total, right? I mean, they are – from that number, they're crushing people. They're seven SP+. plus. This is all good stuff. It seems miragey to me. Um, you know, they played Purdue last week, who didn't exist. Uh, Ken State um, was their first game, didn't exist. Could have, not should have, but definitely could have lost a pit – at home, right, um, if, you know, uh, when Narduzzi isn't a giant moron and doesn't understand math and things like that. So, yeah, um, they rely on big plays. They are very inefficient, particularly in the running game. Almost all of their success comes from giant plays to K.J. Hamler, to Sean Clifford being able to make something happen, and to their running backs who, while very talented, are very inefficient at this point in time. Uh, if you take a look at the Penn, if you take a look at the Purdue game last week, it was all big plays. Once that was shut down, they were still able to move the ball somewhat, but they couldn't finish the damn thing. And I kind of feel like that's the problem. What you're going to get Iowa because Iowa's entire defense is don't allow big plays, play cover two, tackle well, B gap sound. This screams a problem to me, especially Sean Clifford in his first road game, his first real road game at night in a really hostile environment. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of what I'm going to see from there and Iowa will I think allow Penn State to run the ball to an extent they're not going to give up big plays it just this this feels like a game that Penn State may have a pretty decent yardage advantage but they can't get into the damn end zone um, with consistency and and that's kind of how Iowa Iowa wants to be able to play you I, I think for Penn State is how can you find a way to give KJ Hamler the ball especially in short areas because I was going to give up you five yard passes things like that get him the ball in short areas. And if you don't turn the ball over, I think he's so athletic. He can make some good things happen. Um, but it just, what they're trying to do works so well against, against that. Right now they're still, like I said, yards, I think they'll put it up, but I feel like they could put up 300, 350 yards, but score in the teens. If you, and if you score it in the teens, it's going to be a game from a defensive side, you know, Michigan just smacked the hell out of Iowa. Iowa struggled against Iowa state, but this is kind of how Iowa rolls in a lot of ways. And then they play a Kinnick at night and everything has changed. and It's completely different for some reason we don't understand. Um, they have two really good tackles. I think Alaric Jackson, who was their left tackle, played against Michigan, got beat quite a few times. I don't, I think that's more of a him getting back from injury thing. And while Stanley got sacked eight times and they have a great pass rush there for Iowa, the thing about it is the way Michigan did it was a comprehensive win and then um, zone blitzing and really confusing uh, the offensive line. It's not really Penn State's MO. They want to more beat you man-to-man up, play a little bit more man on the front. They don't want to bring an excessive amount of pressure. And that's worked for them in the past because they've had the pass rushers. I don't know if the way they want to rush the passer is going to get to Stanley the way like Michigan got to Stanley. And I think it's going to be able to do well enough to move the ball at times. Now, their run defense has been very good. I do feel, again, a bit of a mirage here to an extent. They were very susceptible last year to it. I'll be very interested to see what Iowa can do. That, that said, Iowa's interior uh, was pretty bad, and, and that does scream a concern to me um, here. So 
what what do I think is going to happen? I, I kind of think Iowa's going to win a game they shouldn't because that just kind of seems how it goes. I think Clifford turns the ball over a couple times, and one that ends up being really bad for him as he throws into a, a cover two zone. I think that they're going to have a yardage advantage overall, but really struggle to finish drives. And I was going to do just enough to win an ugly game like 15-12 because that's the way Iowa does it. Um, would I be shocked if Penn State just goes in there and blows them out? No, I wouldn't say I would be shocked if that ends up happening. I, I just, just think when you take a look at the metrics of the game, again, Vegas only has this a two-point spread. Even S&P Plus, it's really, I think, only a three, a four-point game because um, I was about 20 in SP Plus. Um, given the matchup, the voodoo of the Kinnick, give me Iowa um, outright in this game, in an ugly, stupid game that, that gets people talking. And probably me as a Michigan fan feel a little bit better. All right, one last game on the docket. Uh, no shock what this is, Florida LSU. Uh, LSU is probably my most – well, I could get more criticized by LSU fans than anybody else, and that's fair given how they've played so far. I called them the, I called them while well, Texas is the most overrated team in college football. I said LSU is one right behind them because I don't buy it. And all that's changed is their offense is number four in SP Plus and is just bulldozing everybody using a spread – Speed system, kind of like what I wanted Michigan to do, and we failed at because Gaddis is terrible so far. LSU is doing it, though, so good for you. Still not buying it. So here is the thing, LSU. If you take a look at, just throw a name, Oklahoma as one out there. If you take a look at the quality of teams that have been played from a defensive perspective, you'd find out they're a about equal together. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is Texas defense is trash as the best defense that you've played at 66. So you've been storming, you've been beating up some lemonade stands and some five-year-old Girl Scouts. Now, that being said, you beat the hell out of those Girl Scouts. And I think that your offense is legit because I think Joe Burrows is legit. I was wrong. I'll say it. I was wrong about Joe Burrows. Yep, said it wrong. Um, there are several people who made very good points that he came in late. It's tough to learn offense late, um, which I did take in effect and thought he'd be better than last year, but thought that they would not be able to find any sort of level of efficiency because I didn't feel like that's the quarterback Joe Burrows could be. I could not be more wrong on that. His intermediate game is absolutely NFL worthy of it. Him between, say, the 10 to 20 yard line, it was excellent able anticipation excellent able to read a defense um he's he's been fantastic he's done some real heisman level plays um with him being used as legs he's thrown some dimes deep uh, i i believe in joe burrows that throw he the winning throw he made against texas is the best throw i've probably seen all year it's I mean, if you haven't seen it, go look at it. He's got a dude basically in his chest, and he throws like a 15-yard strike that right in stride that leads it to a touchdown. And a game Texas could have won. Like, holy hell, man. It was awesome. Um, I'm a believer in it. I'm still not number four in the nation believer because I do not trust your offensive coordinator. Um, I Everything he's done has worked because he's played terrible defenses. I, I think – this ends up being a lot more of a system shock than people think. LSU is a freaking 14-point favorite. That's insane to me. Um, part of the reason why I think this is that way, though, because everyone has week zero stuck in their head with Miami and Florida when Florida looked like a disaster. Let me tell you guys, Florida is a good football team. Uh, yes, they probably should have lost to Kentucky. But once Franks went out and Trask 